Chapter 4, A Tour of the Cell. So as we started out the class in Chapter 1, we introduced the hierarchy of life, which began with the atom and worked its way up to the molecule, then the organelle, and the cell. So in Chapter 2, we talked about the atom, and then we combined that into molecules in Chapter 3, so now we're working into organelle and then cell as we move up the hierarchy of life. So in order to know anything about the cell, we had to, we had to be able to see it at some point. And the first time cells were actually viewed and we began to really start figuring out how cells worked was in the 17th century when the microscope was invented. Using a microscope, Robert Hooke discovered cells in 1665. And through the discovery of the cell, he then also determined and came up, helped to come up with the cell theory. Um, for many, many years, we didn't understand what the body was made up of. Well, for the majority, um, of science at this point we had not really understood what the body was made up of and it took two centuries to overcome the past beliefs to accept that cells are the components of all living things which is known as the cell theory so the cell theory in short all living things are made up of cells and cells can only come from the division of pre-existing cells so this is to say that your entire body, from a toenail to a hair cell to an eye cell to a heart cell, um, the entire body is made up of cells. Every part of you is a combination of one or more cells. So here's the cell theory again, but a bit more specific. Cells are the building blocks of all plants and animals and are produced only by the division of pre-existing cells. And cells are the smallest units that perform any vital physiological function, okay? So any chemical reaction, any growth, um, any metabolism is done by cells at the smallest level. In the combination of cells, we can perform much larger physiological functions. So this picture here is actually taken from the anatomy textbook. So you will not find this in your textbook, but I did like the picture because it shows the diversity of cells in the human body. It shows how incredibly different cells can look from one part of the body to the other part of the body. Now, a lot of times when we take biology, we see these perfect, cute little circular cells, which are a great starting point, but cells actually have many different, different shapes and looks to them um, as we go throughout the, the body. And if you go on to take anatomy, you'll really see this up close and personal. So in this picture here, we have several different types of cells, okay? This is a muscle cell. We can see that it's long and skinny and spindle shaped. This is a bone cell, a blood cell, a neuron, which is a very complex cell that makes up the brain and spinal cord. You can see how incredibly large and complex it is. A fat cell, an intestinal cell, a sperm, an egg cell. So each one of those cells is dramatically different from the next, but they all work similarly and all have the same major organelles or tiny cell parts. So we began understanding more about the cell when we first, um, when we had our first microscope. And one of the most basic microscopes we have now, and these are the kind you're gonna be using in your lab, um, are the light microscopes. And these enable us to see the overall shape and structure of a cell. Now this particular type of microscope works by passing light through a specimen like bacteria or tissue. 
So whenever we use a light microscope, we can or we often are looking at living things. Okay, so passing light through a living thing um, is not harmful to that living thing. So we are able to look at living cells. So we can see cells move and carry out functions underneath the microscope sometimes if we have a, a good microscope. But there are other types of microscopes. This again, light microscope, we can look at living things by passing light through them and multiply them or magnify them pretty well. Electron microscopes, on the other hand, are a bit different. These microscopes are incredibly expensive. Some of them 500,000 plus per microscope. And these are so incredibly powerful that we can see hundreds of thousands of times larger than what the actual size of the specimen is. So these guys are incredibly, incredibly good at zooming in very, very far. But there are some downsides to using an electron microscope. We'll talk about that now. Um, electron microscopes were invented much later in the 1950s. They use a beam of electrons instead of light. So the electrons are passed through the specimen. And the problem with that is, though it works really well to magnify things, it is uh, really not so good for looking at living things because passing electrons through a living thing um, will kill it. So we can't look at living things under an electron microscope. We can look at cells that are, that are dead. Now, the great thing about these electron microscopes is the greater magnification and the cell detail. So we can see a lot more using an electron microscope. And there are two kinds of electron microscopes. Um, this one here is called a scanning electron microscope, or SEM for short. Um, and you can see it is extremely large. Um, it's not just like one of these little microscopes you can pick up and carry around in our lab. It's, it's a pretty big deal. And scanning electron microscopes reveal the surface of cells. So we can actually look at the outside surface of a cell. We really can't see the inside details using one of these type of microscopes. But this here is what's called cilia. Um, on the surface of a cell and cilia are little hair-like projections that are found on the surface of cells that actually help to move fluid past to the cells like in the digestive or urinary tract for example. So these particular cilia, um, <clears throat> notice we can see the outside of them. Really can't see the inside, we can't really see what's making up the cell but we can see the outside of the cilia. So it's a very good close-up view of the outside of the cilia. Transmission electron microscopes are a little bit different. Um, these guys are great at looking at the details of the internal cell structure. So we can see inside the cells, we can see the, the organelles that make up the cell using one of these transmission electron microscopes. So this picture here, we're looking at the same cells and we can actually see the inside with all the organelles. You can see all those inside there. So that gives us the details of the internal structure. So a couple of questions for you to see if you're following along well enough. What type of microscope would you want to use if you wanted to study the change in shape of a living rabbit skin cell? Since we said living, that gave us the clue of the light microscope. What about looking at the surface texture of a cell from a fingernail? Scanning electron microscope? Yes, because we want to be able to see the surface. What about the detailed structure of an organelle inside a lung cell? transmission electron microscope because it allows us to see the inside parts of a cell. So before we go much into the cell, reminding you again um, as we move throughout these online chapters that any time you feel the need to copy anything down, like right here, it's a good idea to pause the video and take time to do that because I will not um, stop 
for you to write down notes. So you're going to want to pause me when you're ready to write things down. Now this, I want to go over this little chart before we start talking about sales. And we kind of touched on this a little bit in chapter one. Um, there were three domains that we looked at. Eukarya, Prokarya, or Bacteria, and Archaea. Um, so we're going to go a little further into that, but we're going to we're going to look at two classes of cells today. Um, the first are the eukaryotic cells, and the second we're going to look at are the prokaryotic cells. Now, eukaryotic cells include plants and animals, so you would be considered a eukaryote because you're made up of eukaryotic cells because you are an animal. A rose would also be a eukaryotic being. Um, uh, cabbage, lettuce, grass, all eukaryotic beings. Prokaryotic cells include bacteria and archaea. Remember, I know you know what bacteria are, but archaea, remember, are extreme bacteria that live in very extreme situations, um, like extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme acid, extreme base extreme salt solutions. These guys can withstand a lot of very extreme environments. These are the prokaryotic cells. And the main difference between the two classes are, um, or is, that the eukaryotic cells have what we call a nucleus. And hopefully that word is not new to you because of high school biology. Um, but a nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle. It's an organelle with a membrane that contains DNA, okay? So all eukaryotic cells have nuclei, which are little sacs that surround the DNA. And they're really more than sacs. There's a lot more involved with a nucleus, but we'll just start with that. In the prokaryotic cells, these bacteria and archaea do not have a nucleus at all, okay? That's what separates them from the eukaryotes. Prokaryotic cells or bacteria simply have DNA just like the eukaryotic cells, but the DNA floats freely in the cytoplasm or the interior of the cell. There is no uh, membrane bound nucleus, okay, or membrane bound DNA. So we'll take a closer look at the separation between these two, and we're going to start by looking at the prokaryotic cells. Again, no nucleus, includes bacteria and archaea. So this first picture is a prokaryotic cell, specifically E. coli, um, and I'm quite sure you've heard of E. coli before. Um, we often hear about it in a scary way. Um, e. coli is a bacteria that can infect certain types of meat, um, especially beef, things like ground beef, and it can make people very sick and even kill them. Um, there are di differing degrees of the severity of E. coli strains. There are some that are um, quite mild in comparison to some of these really, really nasty ones that really make people sick. But E. coli can be a friend. Um, it actually lives in the colon of every person and helps you to digest your food better and absorb more nutrients. So E. coli is not all around bad, um, but it does kind of get a bad rap. But in this picture here, this is a bacterial cell. Okay, this is one E. coli cell. And it kind of looks like a pill or a capsule. It's very, very simple. Bacteria are extremely simple. Um, they live very short lives and they divide rapidly. They make new E. coli very quickly, so they need to be very, very simple. Um, you can't really see a lot going on on the inside. We'll talk about what is in there. Um, but right now we just see one little capsule-shaped cell, um, E. coli, no nucleus. This is another bacterial cell, um, and it has a special... Um, a special feature on it that I want to point out. This bacterial cell has lots of little hair-like projections hanging off of it, okay? And those little hair-like projections are called pili, okay? And pili are sticky hairs that will allow bacteria to stick to surfaces, whether it's to the um, table that you're leaning on right now or 
um, your cell phone or your skin bacteria are able to grab on and stick to surfaces by using these little sticky hair-like projections called pili. And this is something very special for a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cells or bacteria can also have little whip-like tails called flagella. Flagella are little tails, almost like little tadpole tails we can see here. Um, and those little tails are for locomotion or movement. So by using those flagella, bacteria can um, whip those tails and move through fluids. And we've actually seen an example of a human cell that has a tail like this, and that would be a sperm. Now, a sperm is a eukaryotic cell, not a prokaryotic cell, because it's an animal cell. But it does, too, have a flagella or tail, just like this bacteria has. So flagella are used for movement or locomotion. Now, eukaryotic cells we talked about are plant and animal cells, and they do have a nucleus. Now, eukaryotic cells are also, one of their features is they are much, much bigger than prokaryotic cells. Huge, in fact, compared to prokaryotic cells, even though they're both microscopic. To give you an idea, if you look at this outline here, this here, this is a eukaryotic cell, a plant or animal cell. We don't know which kind of cell it is, but we can see this whole thing, that's a eukaryotic plant uh, or animal cell, and I'm pretty sure this is an animal cell. So we have this eukaryotic animal cell here, and you see these little purple specks? Those are bacteria, okay? So the bacteria that's on this cell, this gives you an idea how small bacteria are in comparison to the eukaryotic plant or animal cells. Big size difference. Side note, we can also see a nucleus, okay? And that's what's special for eukaryotic cells is that they have a nucleus, okay? So we can see a nucleus inside and then we can see these little bacterial cells and how incredibly different in size they are. This is a, a group of plant cells, okay? So each one of these look like little bricks each one of these little bricks is a plant cell. And plant cells are eukaryotic, they do have a nucleus, and they also have some other special features that make them plant cells. And we'll talk about what those special features are as we move through the chapter. We're gonna kinda, kinda go through this layer by layer. These are animal cells, okay, which are eukaryotic, and they have been stained. So because they've been stained, we can see a lot of detail. Um, and in this picture here, we can see that the cell, this is the eukaryotic cell, has all been stained red. There are two cells here. And each cell contains a nucleus. Okay, there's the nucleus, there's the nucleus. So we know that these are eukaryotic cells because we see nuclei. And by the way, nuclei, is just plural for nucleus. It means more than one nucleus. Okay, so in this picture here, it's a little chart that's found in your book, and we know that most cells lie between the extremes of large cells and the tiniest bacteria, okay? So way up here, we have an area that shows things we can see without a microscope. A whole human, well obviously we don't need a microscope to see a whole human. We don't need a microscope to see a chicken egg or a frog egg. But as we get a little bit smaller, we begin to need a microscope. We do need a light, at least a light microscope to see things like plant and animal cells, bacteria. And as we get even tinier, into the individual organelles that make up tiny, um, make up the tiny parts of the cell, we need an electron microscope. So the smaller we get, the more powerful, more powerful microscope we need in order to see all these little tiny, tiny parts. 
So at minimum, a cell must be big enough to house the parts it needs to survive and reproduce. There are two kinds of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells are small, simple, and do not have a nucleus. And we saw that back here in that chart that I included in the slide for you. So we have prokaryotic cells, no nucleus, include bacteria and archaea, and they are very, very, very small, simple cells. So a typical prokaryote, okay, a typical prokaryotic cell, we know it has no nucleus, and it's very, very simple and very small. So what does it have? Well, one thing it has that we can find inside of a bacterial cell is what's called cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the fluid that fills the inside of a cell. Okay, it's the fluid that fills the inside of a cell. It also allows a place for the organelles to be suspended. Okay, so whatever organelles we might have inside of a cell are floating around in this cytoplasm. So this picture here, we're going to look at some details of a prokaryotic cell. Okay, so here are some of the main features of a prokaryotic cell. So a prokaryotic cell, remember, includes bacteria and archaea and does not have its own nucleus. So prokaryotic cells usually have a membrane which is called the plasma or cell membrane. You can call it either one plasma or cell membrane. And then around that it has a cell wall. Okay, so it's kind of a double layered cell, two membranes. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture here. The innermost membrane is the cell or plasma membrane. The cell or plasma membrane is surrounded by another rigid membrane called the cell wall. So two layers, cell membrane or plasma membrane covered by the cell wall. The cell wall sometimes is covered by a sticky substance and those little pili that will help the bacteria to stick to surfaces. Inside the prokaryotic cell is very, very simple. All we see is the cytoplasm, okay, which is the jelly-like material that fills the inside of the cell, the jelly-like fluid, cytoplasm, and we can see some DNA. That's what this blue stuff is here. Okay, So instead of having a nucleus that holds the DNA, the DNA just freely floats around. Okay, it just freely floats around in the cytoplasm. We can also see that the um, <clears throat> prokaryotic cell has flagella, which are those whip-like tails that will propel the bacteria through a fluid. Okay, so those are the main cell parts of a bacterial cell. If you need to see that again, be sure to rewind it. All other life forms are made up of one or more eukaryotic cells, which includes the plants and animals. These are larger, more complex cells, and they have a true nucleus. So all eukaryotic cells, which again are plant and animal cells, contain a nucleus. So we're going to look at the two types of eukaryotic cells. We have a plant cell and we have an animal cell. So both of these are eukaryotic. They both have a nucleus. But there are some differences between the plant and animal cells. Okay, so we're going to start out with an animal cell and then we're going to look at the plant cell. Okay, so let's begin with the animal cells. All right, so here's a picture of an animal cell that has been taken from your textbook. And this particular animal cell, we can see a lot of stuff crammed into it, okay? Now there are some things we're gonna find that are similar to that bacterial cell, but there's a lot, of, a lot more differences than there are similarities. 
Now, the first thing that I want to point out to you is that the animal cells have a membrane too, okay? So this membrane here that surrounds and encloses the animal cell and protects it from the environment is called the cell or plasma membrane. Cell or plasma membrane. And again, you can use either term, cell or plasma. It doesn't really matter, they're both correct, okay? And it's labeled here, plasma or cell membrane is the membrane that surrounds the animal cell. And just like in the bacterial cell, the animal cell is filled with a jelly-like fluid called cytoplasm, okay? Cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm, again, jelly-like fluid, fills the inside, and allows for all the organelles to have a place to kind of float around, okay? So all of this kind of yellow fluid in between all the organelles, that's all cytoplasm, okay? So we have a membrane and we have cytoplasm so far. Now we're gonna kind of focus in on that membrane just a, a little bit more. Um, the plasma membrane, what's special about it? The plasma membrane controls the cell's contact with the environment. So in other words, the plasma membrane is very picky and choosy about what it lets into the cell and what it lets go out of the cell. And this is important um, because we don't want toxins or bacteria or other things that could hurt the cell just to be able to get in easily. There needs to be some kind of restriction um, between what's, what gets into the cell and what's allowed to get out of the cell. So we certainly want to have a lot of monitoring going on as far as what comes in and what goes out. So the plasma membrane is the cell's first line of defense. It controls the cell's contact with the environment. The cell, as I mentioned to you before, is filled with cytoplasm and the cytoplasm contains organelles and those organelles have membranes too that surround them. Okay, so this is going to kind of make the inside of the cell very neat and tidy and very compartmentalized. So we're going to focus in first on the cell membrane. Okay, the cell membrane or plasma membrane is made up of what's called a phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid bilayer. Cell membrane made up of phospholipid bilayer. Now, what that really means is this, okay? A phospholipid is a, it, it's a special kind of lipid that has a little head and two tails. Okay, so there's a phospholipid right there. That's just one. It's got a little head and two tails, okay? And that phospholipid, um, forms a bilayer with other phospholipids. Bilayer meaning double layer, okay? So we have a layer of phospholipids here on top, and we have a layer of phospholipids there on the inside or bottom, okay? Now, the special thing to know about phospholipids is that phospholipids have two parts to them. They have a head and they have tails, okay? Now the head is what we call hydro Hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means water loving. Hydrophilic means water loving. Okay? And there's the word hydrophilic right there. Hydrophilic. Water loving. So what you're looking at here is this is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell. So this is the cytoplasm that's inside the cell and this is the membrane of the cell. So the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipids are facing outward where the fluid is that surrounds the cell. Every cell is surrounded with a special type of fluid called extracellular fluid. This keeps the cells nice and moist. So we have the extracellular fluid on the outside of the cell and those hydrophilic or water loving heads are facing that fluid and then we have the heads down here facing the cytoplasm, which is also a fluid. 
so the heads are kept moist, which is what they want. Now the inside where the tails are, those tails are hydrophobic, okay, hydrophobic, which means water fearing, okay. The tails do not like water, they don't want to be near it, so they face inward. And this creates a double layer, which makes up our cell membrane, okay. So we often describe the cell membrane as having a phospholipid bilayer or double layer. Now a plant cell, we, we mentioned we're going to kind of separate plant and animal cells a little bit. Even though they're both eukaryotic, they both have a nucleus, plant and animal cells, there are some differences between plant and animal cells. Plant cells have some structures that animal cells don't, okay? One of them is, a is having a chloroplast, and one is that plant cells have a cell wall, much like the bacterial cell, okay? And we're gonna get to that in a minute. Um, but a chloroplast is um, an organelle that helps capture light to make food for the plant. Chloroplast helps capture light to make food for the plant. And a cell wall we've already talked about, but I'll show you in a picture in just a minute of what the cell wall um, is going to look like, okay? So a typical animal cell, let's go back to an animal cell because we're separating animal and plant. An animal cell has a plasma membrane, that's what this is, and the cell is filled with cytoplasm, which is the jelly-like fluid, and a bunch of organelles, which we haven't talked about yet. Those are all the little cell parts. So let's look at how a plant cell looks a little different, okay? Um, this is a plant cell, and it has a lot of the same stuff on the inside of it as the animal cell does, but there are a couple of differences. Now, here, this rigid covering on the outside of the plant cell, that's called the cell wall. It's very similar to the cell wall in the bacteria, okay? Cell wall makes the plant a little more rigid. And right underneath the cell wall, if we peel a little bit of it back, is the plasma membrane. Okay, so the plasma membrane is under the cell wall. So the plant cell also has a double layer of protection. Inside, just like the animal cell, we have cytoplasm, which is the jelly-like fluid that floats on the inside of the cell. And we have some organelles that are all crammed in that we'll talk about in a little bit as well, okay? So we've started out with the membranes and we started out with the cytoplasm. Now the nucleus is the cell's genetic control center, okay? This is usually the largest organelle in the cell and it contains the DNA that directs the cell's activities. The nucleus also has its own special membrane around it, which is called the nuclear envelope, okay? Nuclear envelope or nuclear membrane, whichever you would like to call it, but they both would be acceptable. So let's look at the nucleus and then we'll see how it fits into the cell. Okay, so this is a picture of a nucleus, and this particular picture was taken from the anatomy textbook, so you won't be able to find this one, but I do have another one coming up that's from your textbook. Um, so here's the nucleus. It's an organelle that contains the DNA. DNA, of course, is what carries all the genes that code for who you are. Not only do you have DNA, but plants have DNA too. So here's the nucleus. Here's the nuclear membrane that surrounds the nucleus, and then the DNA is found on the inside of the nucleus. Now this picture is from your textbook, um, and we can see the whole nucleus there, the nuclear membrane, which surrounds the nucleus, and then the DNA, which is on the inside of the nucleus. Okay, so let's go back and see how those nuclei fit into the animal and plant cell. So here's the nucleus that holds the plant, the animal's DNA. 
Here's the plant cell, and there's the nucleus in the plant cell. The endomembrane system is a collection of organelles that have membranes. We've talked about the nucleus, which certainly has a membrane, but there are some other organelles that have a membrane too. These organelles manufacture and distribute cell products. The endomembrane system um, includes an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and there are two endoplasmic reticula. Okay, so I'm going to go back and show you what they look like. Okay, so here surrounding the nucleus is what we call the endoplasmic reticulum, and there are two parts of endoplasmic reticulum. We have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is covered by little bumps. Okay, and if you look close, you can see all those little bumps. It kind of makes the ER, which is what we call it for short, endoplasmic reticulum, ER, it makes the ER look bumpy and kind of sandpapery, kind of looks sandpapery, sandpapery and rough, which is why we call it the rough ER. Those little sandpapery specks are called ribosomes, okay? And ribosomes have a very important function, and that function is to make protein. Ribosomes make protein, which are very important for the cell, which is very important for the cell. So we'll get to ribosomes in a minute. But ribosomes cover the rough ER and give it a rough studded appearance. The smooth ER does not have ribosomes on it, so it looks very, very smooth. Smooth ER, no ribosomes. Okay, so we can see that in the animal cell, and we can also see it in the plant cell. Here's the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER makes, uh, manufactures membranes that contain proteins, okay? So I want to show you what that, how that works and what that means. So in this picture here, which is also in the anatomy book, so you're not going to find it, but I do love this picture for this explanation, so I, I'm going to use this to help you to understand. <clears throat> but in this picture here, we're looking at a little segment of a cell, okay? And over here we have the rough ER and the smooth ER. We can tell that's rough because it has ribosomes on it, and this one does not. Now the rough ER's job is to make little membrane vesicles that contain proteins. Okay, so let's talk about what that means. Um, I told you a minute ago that the ribosomes make protein. That's their job, and protein is very useful in the cell. Um, to give you an idea, proteins make up your hair, skin, nails, muscle, the lens of your eye. Um, they make up part of the heart wall. I mean, we could go on and on. They make up the hemoglobin that carries oxygen in the blood. So proteins are some of the most important um, molecules in the body. So we do need to constantly be making as many as we can to keep up with the protein demand. So ribosomes make protein. The rough ER, the rough ER, you can kind of imagine the rough ER as the cell's factory. It's going to make products that the cell can use, okay? So the rough ER is going to ship those products out. It's going to send them out in little bubbles called transport vesicles. Transport vesicles, okay? Now, not only does the rough ER do that, but the smooth ER does that too. The rough ER packages proteins into vesicles, the smooth ER packages lipids, lipids or fats, packages lipids into vesicles. These vesicles, again, are called transport vesicles, and transport vesicles do what they sound like, they transport goods. Those transport vesicles, the rough and the smooth transport vesicles, are going to go straight to the next organelle, 
which is called the Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus. Okay? The Golgi apparatus is its own special organelle, and you can almost Im imagine it as the U.S. Postal Service of the cell. Its job is to take products, wrap them up, package them, and ship them out. Okay, just like the Postal Service does. All right? So we have the transport vesicle of the rough ER and the transport vesicle of the smooth ER, both carrying goods to the Golgi. The Golgi will package and ship those products out. Okay? So here the Golgi is shipping out the protein that the rough ER made. And that protein is packaged into a new kind of vesicle called a secretory vesicle. Secretory does what it sounds like, it secretes materials. So that secretory vesicle is going to go straight to the membrane of the cell and shoot out the product. And the process of shooting something out of a cell is called exocytosis, to eject or exit something from the cytoplasm or cell. So the product that we made can be shipped out of the cell to be used elsewhere. Protein, secretory vesicle, shipped out. Same thing can happen to this, the transport vesicles of the smooth ER. We can package the lipids into the secretory vesicle and those secretory vesicles can either ship out or we could add those lipids to the membrane which is made up of lipids, phospholipids. Okay. So let's go back and see what slide we missed. Okay, so the rough ER manufactures membranes that contain proteins. The smooth ER synthesizes lipids. Synthesize meaning makes. Synthesizes lipids and in some cells it can help regulate metabolism and break down toxins and drugs. Okay, so this is a picture of the nucleus, the rough, and the smooth ER. We looked at that a little while ago in our animal cell picture. The Golgi apparatus consists of stacks of membranes. Um, this is what I refer to as the U.S. Postal Service of the cell. They receive and modify ER products and then send them on to other organelles or to the cell membrane. We saw that happening in the picture we looked at just a minute ago. Okay, this is a picture of the Golgi. So this is where we left off and we had just showed how the Golgi can ship those products out. Now the Golgi can do a third thing. Not only can it ship out protein and lipids, but it also can make its own organelle. And that organelle is called a lysosome. Okay? Lysosomes are sacs of digestive enzymes that are budded off of the Golgi. Okay? Lysosomes are sacs of digestive enzymes. You can imagine lysosomes um, much like the trash disposal surface of the cell. Um, these guys are going to digest food for the cell, destroy bacteria, recycle damaged organelles, they take care of all the trash, things that can't be used anymore, and they can also function in embryonic development in animals. Okay. Now that last point is a little bit different than the points above it. So what does that really mean? Well, what it means is that each lysosome is filled with digestive enzymes, enzymes that break down materials. Now, when you were an embryo and you were developing in your mother's womb, um, we all start out with webbed fingers. Just like a frog, um, we have webbing between our fingers when we're first developing. Now, obviously, we don't want to be born with webbed fingers. That would certainly um, create a lot of problems as we go went through um, adulthood. But 
Webbed fingers are not normal once we're actually born, but during development we do have them. Well, at a certain point in embryonic development, all of the flesh between the fingers that creates the webbing, the cells in that webbing will burst their lysosomes. Okay, And think about what would happen to a cell if its lysosome burst. The lysosome is full of enzymes that digest and dissolve. So if those lysosomes were to pop open and all those digestive enzymes were to spill out into the cell, what do you think is going to happen to the cell? It's going to kill it. So if all of the cells in the webbing between the fingers in the embryo, if all of those cells release their lysosomal enzymes, then that will digest that flesh and then the fingers will be freed. So that's how we lose our webbing. So whenever we want to disintegrate a tissue during development and embryonic development, we can use lysosomes to dissolve that tissue. So let's go back a little and look at the Golgi and the lysosome in our picture of our two cells. Okay, so the Golgi in the animal cell is here. That's our U.S. Postal Service. And here is our lysosome, our little trash disposal system. Okay, in the plant cell, we can look at um, the Golgi. Okay, so the Golgi is here. Okay, and that Golgi is the U.S. Postal Service for the plant cell. Now the plant cell uses another method um, for trash disposal, and we'll look at that in just a little bit. Okay. All right, so this picture kind of reinforces what we talked about of the trash disposal methods of the lysosome. So here we have the rough ER and the rough ER buds off some protein in a little transport vesicle and that transport vesicle joins into the Golgi which is our US Postal Service okay and the Golgi remember the Golgi can do three things it can ship out materials out of the cell or it can make lysosomes so in this picture we're going to look at what happens when lysosomes are produced so one option is Lysosomes can engulf damaged organelles. So if there's an organelle that's not working anymore, then the lysosome can engulf it. Chew it up, digest it, and get rid of that damaged, non-functioning organelle. Or the cell can take in a food particle. Sometimes the cell will take in a food particle. When that food particle comes in, the lysosome can engulf it, chew it up, digest it, and absorb nutrients for the cell. Here's something different about a plant cell. Um, the plant cell contains a large central vacuole. The vacuole has lysosomal and storage functions. Okay, so going back to that plant cell, here it is. Here is the lysosome. It's a large storage compartment for the plant cell. And not only does it provide storage, but it also is going to provide lysosomal functions. In other words, it will help the plant to digest and get rid of things it doesn't need, as well as act as a storage system for the plant. Okay, so moving forward from vacuoles, um, this picture shows that all the organelles of the endomembrane system are interconnected structurally and functionally. This shows the nucleus, the rough and smooth ER, the Golgi, and the lysosomes and how they all work together to release products, dissolve products. They're all a big team. Chloroplasts are found in plants and some proteins. Um, chloroplasts are the little organelles that will help convert solar or sun energy into chemical energy and sugar. 
So plants make their own food by absorbing sunlight. And chloroplasts will help the plants to do that because they're going to absorb sunlight so that the plant can in turn make sugars or starches for its own food source. Now in that same plant cell picture, we can see the chloroplast here. Chloroplasts, okay, little green organelles that are going to help for the plant to absorb sun. We also saw a picture close to the beginning of the chapter um, where we were looking at a wall of plant cells. Okay, this is a wall of plant cells. We can see all the individual plant cells, and in this picture, we're looking under a microscope. And you see all the little green circles? Those are all chloroplasts. So each cell has an army of chloroplasts whose job is to absorb sunlight to help the plant make energy. Okay, the next organelle to talk about is the mitochondria. The mitochondria carry out a process called cellular respiration, which we will talk about a little later. Cellular respiration um, it's a very complex process, but what you need to know about it right now is that the mitochondria make energy. They make energy for the plant. Um, and this, this energy in particular is called ATP. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna start with ATP for now and we will define what that is a little later in, in further chapters. Um, but ATP is the energy that the cell uses to complete cellular work. Um, mitochondria make energy. They're like the little Georgia powers of the cell, like little Georgia powers of the cell making energy constantly. Um, here's our animal cell and there's the mitochondria right there. Little Georgia power of the cell pumping out energy at all times. Plant cell also has mitochondria right here, okay, making energy for the plant cell. Okay, so again, in our little cellular town or city, it is making energy for us. This is a close-up picture of a mitochondria, and um, again, it's going to make that ATP energy for the, for the plant or animal. And next we have cytoskeleton. Um, a cytoskeleton is a network of protein fibers that makes up the inside of the cell. Cytoskeleton, it kind of sounds like a skeleton, but it's not made out of bone, it's made out of protein. And its job is to give the cell some shape or structure. To give the cell some shape or structure, cytoskeleton. Um, and the cytoskeleton is made up of some parts. And some of those parts, they're all different names for proteins, but it's not as complex as it might seem. Um, it's made up of microfilaments, intermediate filaments, microtubules, <clears throat> which can give the cell rigidity, provide anchors for organelles, and act, act as tracks for organelle movement. Okay, so this is a tiny almost a tiny little skeletal system in a way, but it's made up of protein, and it gives the cell shape and structure. This is what the cytoskeleton looks like up close. Um, in this picture here, we can see a network of proteins give the cell shape and structure. Here, we can see inside the cell that it's given the cell some shape that also allows a place for organelles to hook on. And can help make what are called cilia and flagella. We do, we've already talked about flagella, so we are familiar with flagella. Those are the little whip-like tails that help to move a cell from one place to another. But cilia we have not yet talked about. Um, cilia are little hair-like projections, little hair-like projections that are going to help to move fluids across a cell surface. Um, in this picture here, these are cilia on top of the cell. Okay, you can see them there, or in this view here, 
little hair-like projections that help move fluids across the cell surface. Cells interact with their environments and each other using their surfaces. Plant cells have cell walls that are made of, largely made of cellulose, which is that really tough stringy material we, we see sometimes in celery. And they connect by what are called plasmodesmata, which are channels that will allow them to share food, water, and messages back and forth. So we'll look at a picture of the plasmodesmata here, okay? And you can kind of imagine the plasmodesmata as little, um, <clears throat> as little lead-ins from one cell to another. So here in this picture, we can see groups of cells, okay? There's a cell there, there's a plant cell there, there's another one there. So we're looking at a tissue, which is a combination of cells. And in between each of the cells, we can see these little hallways or little portals that lead from one cell to another. And this is actually good because it allows for one cell to communicate with its neighbor. One cell to communicate with its neighbor. Um, and this is called plasmodesmata. So the plant cell can tell this plant cell something or they can share materials between the two. Act as a team rather than an individual. Animal cells have a sticky coating that helps bind them together to make tissues. And they also have what are called anchoring junctions. The anchoring junctions link animal cells and we have tight junctions and communicating junctions. Let's look at the three of those. On the top here we have a tight junction. Tight junctions connect cells to each other. Okay, it's, it's a fusion of cell membranes. So this is a cell here and this is a cell here. Okay, And this tight junction is connecting the cells to each other, a fusion of their membranes. And this is good because not only will it help the cells to make a sheet or a tissue, it also keeps bad things, toxins and other materials from seeping down in between the cells and creating a problem. Anchoring junctions, we can see this one here, they anchor one cell to another, keeps them in a sheet, and then we have communicating junctions. Communicating junctions allow for animal cells to communicate back and forth, so it's very much like a plasmodesmata of the animal cell, that we, or the plant cell we talked about where we can communicate. It's the same thing, we just kind of call it something different. It's where animal cells can communicate and share materials and messages back and forth between them so that they too can act as a team and not as individuals. So finally we have um, a, a little chart that you can find in your textbook. Eukaryotic organelles fall into four groups and this is a great uh, study chart because it lists all of the organelles we talked about and describes um, what their functions are. So you can look at this as a review as you begin studying for your test to remind yourselves of what all each organelle can do. Okay, and this concludes chapter four.